We've cleared all of the negative bias to the market. We've broken the downtrend. And the only thing stopping the markets right now between where they are and, and you know, all-time highs really is the all-time highs, right? That's really the next level of resistance. So at least for now, through September the 5th, um, the bias is likely going to be the upside. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back here at the end of the week for another weekly market recap featuring my good and commemorative friend, Lance Roberts. Lance, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. What are we commemorating? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. We're going to commemorate the unboxing of the ah. YouTube celebratory plaque for Thoughtful Money hitting 100,000 subscribers. I, I promised everybody that we would do a live unboxing here on the screen. So um, I will uh, I'll start doing that now. Um, but uh, this is the result of um, a lot of hard work on a lot of people's behalf. Um, you right there at the top of the list, joining me every week on this program, Lance. Um, so folks, if you've wondered you know, what the experience is like, what you get uh, from YouTube when you hit 100,000 subscribers, you get this fancy black cardboard box. Um, take off the protective foam here and you get a... Uh, Oh, looks like a very nice uh, letter here from YouTube. I'll read it later on. Uh, but then you actually get the plaque itself. Let's take it out of its protective wrapping here. Um, yeah, it's fairly substantial. Um, looks like it's made out of aluminum. Obviously, it's supposed to be silver because you get a gold colored one when you, you hit a million. So Lance, we've got still some more wood to chop here to get to our next one. Um, but this says presented to thoughtful money for passing 100,000 subscribers. Um, this would not be possible by definition without the support of everybody watching this video here, having clicked, uh, clicked the subscribe button and watching every week. Um, so uh, I just can't express really how gratitude, how grateful I am uh, for everybody who's watching. And like I said, Lance, you're right up there at the top of the list for not only watching this channel, I know you're a subscriber, uh, but being here with me every week, week after week, um, making content for folks and uh, you know, doing our best to try to serve up some financially nutritious material for people that wanna figure out what's going on in the markets and uh, be good stewards of their wealth. So anyways, folks, um, I'll, find, uh, I'll find some way to put this up on the wall, uh, but definitely will be uh, very cherished. But uh, also let's use this as a challenge, Lance, to say a hundred thousand is wonderful, but game on. Let's go to a million. See, uh, and see, I think I don't think that's right. Right? They should. <laughs> this should be a. No, I'm just saying this should be a bronze one, right? And five hundred thousand should be the silver, and then you get to a million. There's just too big of a gap between a hundred thousand and a million, right? There needs to be. There needs to be a break point somewhere in between. There is, and I think the next one after this is. I think it's. I think it's diamond. There's a diamond one and a ruby one, I think, but but I think it kicks in at 10 million. So you get to a million and you're like, wow, gosh, we made a million. And then they're like, yeah, well, we needed to 10X that. Like, oh my God, that you get another cool plaque. Of course, they don't tell you how much money they're making off your off your viewership you know, by selling them ads. But, you know, hey, nice to give you a plaque, right? Yeah, it is. And look, I mean, this, this has got some heft to it, but yeah, it's brushed aluminum. Um, I don't want to criticize it in any way, shape or form, but I'm going to guess, you know, the manufacturing cost of this to them at probably the scale they do it at is in the dozens of dollars, you know? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think their margins are pretty, are, are pretty safe right now. They're, um, doing, they're doing just fine. They're doing just fine. And, and I don't have this on the, the list today to talk about, but at some point, Lance, we should talk about the recent um, antitrust action against Google. Um, you know, I, I, I've been saying for years, many, many years, even before I started doing this thoughtful money stuff. And I know you and I've talked about this briefly in the past, um, that it, it, on some metrics, it's, it just boggles my mind why Google isn't declared a monopolist, uh, in certain things, uh, search obviously being at the top of the list. Um, and that's not even necessarily really what they're, they're being gone after here for, um, they're, they're, they're being gone after, I think part of their search market share on mobile devices, um, and they're also getting um, attention for their, um, uh, you know, their huge uh, ownership of the digital advertising market. But I, I haven't looked at the, the stats recently, but for, you know, 20 years, 
their search market share has been in the 90th percentile. And at some point, you know, like 95%. I, I just don't know when you have a market that is that ridiculously lucrative and universal that that kind of market share can be argued as not being uh, anti-competitive. Right. Well, I mean, there's, you know, the, the whole thing is, you know, when you talk about monopolies is, you know, in particular, just, you know, kind of from the basis of a monopoly, does it prevent other people from entering the space to start creating the same opportunity, right? And and so I think the antitrust case is going to have a bit of a challenge because just from that, just talking about their share of, of advertising ownership, you know, they do have a very large chunk of it, but I can also advertise on Facebook. I can advertise on TikTok. I can advertise. There's, there's other competitors out there that are eating into that share of advertising but Google is just, they were there first. They have absorbed a big chunk of those clients. And it's and it's part of just the normal ad spend when, you know, for instance, if we're looking to do online digital marketing, it's just, okay, where do you start with? Well, first place is we go to Google, then we go to Facebook, then we go to TikTok, and we're going to run ads in all these different places. And it's, it's, it's almost kind of a, it's not even con a consideration of, you know, do I advertise with Google or not? or TikTok or Facebook, I do it because I have to if I want to compete. So I, I think it's going to be an interesting case that they try to make because there are competitors in the space. Well, I'll pull the data when we have this conversation for real. But um, I know I don't know what TikTok's penetration has become, but I know up until recently, I mean, it pretty much was a two man show. It was Google yeah. and Facebook. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and anybody that's been in digital media for a prolonged period of time, has seen the economics of digital advertising just be on a slow, steady decrease as uh, the share that these Goliaths take continues to increase. You know, you you can't, it, it, you almost can't create an ad supported, purely ad supported online business anymore because um, the the margins just aren't there. I mean, unless you're at tremendous volume, um, right. which is you know very very small number of the players, um, you have to have, uh, and that's why every content creator, you know, initially they had blogs that were supported by ads that model's done and then everybody moved to a premium subscription model and then that's now oversaturated and uh so um so anyways um it's going to be really interesting but it's it's um it has it cer it certainly caught my attention that um you know the regulators are finally beginning to start to show some teeth here we'll see what really happens i am absolutely certain that google's you know army of lobbyists are, are on this <laughs> and are probably going to defang most of what's getting talked about right now, but we'll see. Well, I mean, you know, remember, remember we broke up AT&T, um, you know, many, many years ago. People don't remember this, but we broke AT&T up, divided them into different bells around the, the country. There were four different, you know, uh, bell operators at that point after we broke up AT&T. And it was great. Boy, we, we got them. We broke up the monopoly. And then over the course of the years, AT&T just absorbed them all again. We, we, exactly. <laughs> we let it we, with the whole thing just, yeah, basically reabsorb itself. And and that's probably the ebb and flow, honestly, between, you know, uh, the free market and, and regulation here. Uh, we'll probably see more of the same. Um, but, but I, do, I do agree with this one thing with you uh, real quick about this. Look, I think there's a really easy solution to fixing the Google problem is that you do force them to spin off YouTube so that YouTube is a company. Google search is a company and basically you break these big giant behemoths up into their individual parts. Same thing for Facebook, honestly. Uh, you break up Facebook into Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, et cetera, and make them their own independent companies. That gives other smaller competitors. So if I if, so if I'm Kick, as an example, or if I'm Twitch, which are online video streaming platforms, I now have a better ability to compete with YouTube alone, just as a standalone, versus the Goliath behind YouTube, which is Google or their massive, you know, revenues and earnings. So just breaking these companies up into independent competitors would help free up that space quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've heard a lot of that, um, especially, you know, with the Amazons and Microsofts of the world where their, their whole cloud computing, you know, operations, which, you know, I, I, the Chinese wall is that the, the profits from those operations isn't supposed to subsidize their other businesses which they say doesn't happen, but I think wink, wink, nod, nod, everybody knows that it's really going on. Yeah. So it uh, wouldn't surprise me if that's where we end up going here. But again, you know, these um, these companies, you know, wised up to the value of, um, you know, 
good Wall Street lobbyists, and they are incredibly entangled uh, with a lot of sitting politicians right now. So it's it's going to take a long time, I think, before DC gets to the point where it is really willing to to take a chance out of these companies like that. Absolutely. All right. Well, look, um, big question for you, Lance. Everybody's been asking me since last week. Um, hey, did we see the bottom last week? You know, when we were talking, you were thinking uh, that um, ah, maybe quite not yet. And I know you your your longer story is is you're more like, hey, things are going to get rocky between now and the election, and so we probably haven't seen the bottom from that yet. But I think the bounce was probably maybe a little bit more robust than most folks thought it was going to be. When we were talking last time and looking at the, the, the technicals, um, we were looking at the 100 daily moving average and wondering if it was going to provide resistance. But nope, it was like tissue paper. <laughs> S&P just, you know, tore right up on through it. Uh, so anyways, what are you thinking about the, the current market action since last week? And is is the is, are the technicals moving into a place where maybe the party could get going again from here? So I'm going to title your video for this week. So I know you have a tendency to, to title everything the most bearish thing possible. But the title for this week's video is The Bulls Are Back, The Correction Is Over. That's your title. Okay. Um, and the reason is, and I actually have an article I published, actually quite timely, I published this article Tuesday, very early Tuesday morning. And the article is titled, Are the Mega Caps Due for a Mega Comeback? And that has been the driver for this past week. And the reason for that article and the reason for this rally is the fact that all the share buybacks have now returned. And we've seen a massive inflow of corporate buybacks back into, into the market ever since the, the, the end of earnings season, which was um, really we had about 80 percent of the companies reporting had completed their earnings process just prior to the flash crash Monday of last week. So we had 80% of companies in that opened up the window for all the buybacks. So as that kind of flash crash carry trade unwound last Monday, got everybody certainly very concerned. Um, but right after that, we saw hedge funds step in, start buying. Hedge funds have been liquidating uh, shares really in the technology space in particular, um, really over the last half of July. They stepped in big uh, during that Monday decline, had a lot of hedge fund buying, started there. Retail investors piled in starting on Wednesday. We saw a big surge of, of retail buyers as that kind of fear of missing out has now crept back up because they're, they're worried that they're going to miss the bottom. So we've seen a lot of that FOMO. Um, but we not only cleared through, as you said, the 100-day moving average provided no resistance. The 20-day provided nothing. The 50-day provided nothing. And yesterday, uh, on Thursday, we were one and a half percent above the 50-day moving average. So we completely cleared, and we'll have a, a technical chart we can look at in a minute, but we've cleared all of the negative bias to the market. We've broken the downtrend, and the only thing stopping the markets right now between where they are and, and you know all-time highs really is the all-time highs, right? That's really the next level of resistance. So at least for now, through September the 5th, um, the bias is likely going to be the upside because we have a lot of share buybacks coming into the market. So you got a lot of momentum back in stocks and a lot of that recent sell-off worked off most of that technically overbought condition. Okay. Um, yeah. So okay. let's, let's, let's pull up the chart if we can, just to sort of visualize for folks, everything that's going on. So um, it, it, I'm not going to hold you to this, but gut feel um, our new all-time highs likely from here. At the moment, yeah. Um, the most logical case right now for the markets is going to be a pullback to the 50-day moving average. We, we've moved very fast, very quick. We've had a, we've had a 6% gain in roughly two weeks. So it was a very, very rapid move higher. Uh, so again, a little bit of a relaxation here would be certainly logical. Get a pullback towards the 50-day moving average, maybe the 20 um, is possible. Uh, but then you find some buyers are going to step in there and you know, potentially we start kind of rallying up towards uh, all-time highs. Again, September the 5th is is the date to watch, though. Sorry, September Maybe the 5th. Maybe you about the date. <laughs> but what's the significance of September 5th? Sorry, I'm, I'm missing it. <laughs> September 5th is when the window closes for buybacks. Okay. All right. Sorry. Thanks. All right. Get it. And so, um, so a couple of things set up the markets, you know, for an October pullback. 
uh, which is, you know, we talked about that kind of potential for the markets to de-risk a bit prior to the election. So you do set the markets up for, you know, a pullback towards the 100-day moving average potentially uh, sometime between the end of September as buybacks kind of pull out and you get de-risking of the markets going into the election. Then right after the election starts, buybacks come back again. So again, remember last year we talked about why we would have a very strong rally into the year end, and it was primarily because of buybacks. And so that same setup is going to occur right after the November election. Okay. All right. And I'm resisting um, the urge to, you know, get on the should buybacks really remain legal bandwagon that we've been on many, many times. So we'll not do that this time. But let me ask a couple of questions about the sure. chart here. Yeah. Um, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but it's probably worth revisiting. Um, there's an old saying in technical analysis that gaps get filled. Yep. Um, and if you look at, you know, the recent downward market action before the latest, you know, rip here, mm -hmm. um, you, you saw some really big gaps open up. Um, so one, I'm going to guess you, you're, you're probably not terribly surprised um, that those gaps got filled just because of the old adage that gaps get filled. Um Two questions for you, if you can answer both at once. One is, um, I mean, how meaningful is this kind of gaps adage? Is, 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 is it there for a reason? Um, or is it is it one of these sort of fallacies that we hear and think has a lot of significance, but it doesn't? And then secondly, when the market really drops off like it did um, and then roars back like this, is that as, as bullish of a sign as it seems? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so both the answers to both your questions is, is yes. Um, the gaps are important because normally what happens is, is when you get a gap lower, that's not a good thing, right? So something's happened in the mar in the market or a stock price in general gaps lower. And what generally happens is, is the market tries to fill that gap, but that gap provides a lot of resistance. So if, if you fill the gap and fail, then typically you turn lower and then, and then keep going down. Right. So, what happened in this case, though, is we not only filled the gap, we just blew right through it, kept going. So in this case, these gaps really didn't mean a, a tremendous amount. But in specifics to your to your second question, uh, in last weekend's newsletter, we addressed uh, we addressed this in particular um, and, and looked at this in terms of looking back at previous periods in history where you've had these very sharp, quick downturns. And those typically mark the bottoms of those. So, you know, whether it was 1987, 2011, you had these very sharp drops. You had these exogenous events that occurred. Uh, 1987 was portfolio insurance. 2011 was the Japan earthquake. Um, and then in 19, um, uh, 2015, you had basically Brexit uh, occur, which caused a very sharp downturn in the markets uh, because, again, we were... Uh, that was unexpected. Everybody was talking about it. Nobody expected it to happen. And it kind of happened all at once. Um, and then you also had in, in 2018, you had the Fed kind of freak the market out. And every one of those instances where you have these very, and then of course, now you had the, the end carry trade. And every one of those instances, you have these very sharp, exogenous attacks, right? So again, this is the one thing that you and I have addressed so often on, on this, you know, on this conversation and keeps continuing to get overlooked is that the things you talk about, the, the things that you think you know about the markets are not the things that are gonna cause the market to crash. So if you're if you're looking at Israel or you're looking at Iran or China or uh, the dollar or the debt or those any of those issues, right? Those are well known by the marketplace. The market has already factored all that stuff in. And so those are not the events that cause major downturns in markets. What causes a major downturn in the market is an unexpected exogenous event and then the result of that exogenous event. So in this case, you know, we saw the yen carry trade, which was very quickly factored in by the market. Yep, it's an unwind. The yen spiked. The Bank of Japan has stepped in, so they won't hike rates anymore right now. So that calmed the yen down. And very quickly, those margin calls passed by. The market factored all that in and started buying and said, OK, that, that, that risk is now passed. So I'm going to go put my money back to work. And so they started leveraging back up into that same carry trade that just blew up, right? So they've already factored all that in. Um, and that's why I saw this very quick recovery in the market. So what would have caused that exogenous event to become a bigger deal would have been a increased rise in the yen that then, then morphed 
into a credit-related concern where you started maybe blowing out credit spreads across a, variety, a, a wide variety of, of credit issues that impacted financial markets from that perspective, that could have led to a bigger decline in the overall market, but that didn't happen. So uh, again, the, the thing that triggers these downturns in the markets and the things you need to worry about are these unexpected exogenous events that you have no idea are coming and you will never know they're coming because if you know they're coming or if you're even thinking about it, the market's already thought about it. So it's now it's expected or it's known. So it's not a big risk to the markets. What is a big risk to the markets are the things that show up overnight that wasn't there yesterday. It's here today. And now you've got to deal with it. And so that's why you, the markets react very quickly because all at once, everybody goes, I'm out. And they've got to get out at one time. And there's a rush for the for these exits to the door. And, and that's what causes these big, sharp downturns in markets. And they are hard to navigate. And that's why, you know, we talk consistently, you know, in June and July, we were saying, hey, look, we're going to have a five to 10 percent correction. We've got all the ingredients for a correction, reduce risk, raise cash balances, rebalance your portfolio, those type of things. Everybody's like, yeah, Lance, whatever. You keep saying that for two months and the market doesn't correct. We had an eight and a half percent decline from the peak, right, right within our target decline of five to 10 percent. OK. And last week. You know, you were saying, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're, we're nibbling a little bit, but we're not seeing yep. the the entry point to start buying yet. Given the action that's taken place since last week, is that giving you guys a green light to start buying more? I use the word aggressively, but 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 you know, it, 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 increasing your buying. Yeah, yeah, no, we uh, we didn't do really any buying this. We we kind of bought some along the way. We increased our position in AMD as an example. We bought some. Um, we added to our position in our natural gas uh, play, uh, OKE, but we actually did a, a bit of re just reduction and rebalancing across the whole portfolio. Yeah. Um, we will add back. We're, we're probably going to become more aggressive buyers, you know, once we see this this kind of rally give us a little bit of an entry point. Again, it's been very aggressive on this rally. It's gone very quick, very far, very quick. Um, so, uh, you know, we're we're looking for an opportunity to add to positions we like, um, and particularly in our mega cap stocks that we took profits in back on July the 13th. Um, we'll look for a little bit of a correction there to kind of add back to those positions at some point. But uh, again, we're real patient with that. We still have our, our positions are still fine. We still have a weight in all these positions. And the portfolio did fantastic during the whole decline. The portfolio is actually at all time highs right now versus the market, which is not. So um, performance during that correction, we did very, very well during that because of our bond positions that performed well. Um, as I said last week on the show, you can't buy bonds here right now. That's still the case today. You still can't buy bonds at the moment. They're still overbought. Um, but well, you, you, you can buy them. They're just overbought. Yeah. Yeah. And you can buy them. Yeah. Just <laughs> if you buy them here, you're running the risk of, of downside in, in your purchase. Um, I think we'll get a better entry point over the course of the next you know, few months, potentially, if we keep seeing strong economic reports, like we saw with the retail sales numbers, uh, that's going to put pressure on bonds here short term. Okay. I want to get to the new the new data that came out this week in just a second. Um, but you know, up until a couple of days ago, the chatter was still all about the unwind of the yen carry trade, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a massive influence. And we talked about why, uh, I think, two videos ago. Um, but all of a sudden it seems like eh, eh, everything's fine. Um, is it on the carry trade side of things? And then earlier too, you mentioned, um, uh, credit spreads and, you know, two weeks ago you said, oh, I'm beginning to see some stuff there that shows that, you know, on, on the weakest end of the credit market yields are beginning to move. Um, is that continued or now since things are, you know, equilibrating after the carry trade scare? Our yields tightening again. Yep. Uh, so the spreads second, tightening again. Yeah. The, the second question is easiest. Yes, credit spreads are tightening again. So again, that that whole concern has very quickly kind of fallen away. Uh, again, markets aren't really concerned about anything right now. Take a look at the volatility index, which had a very sharp spike uh, last Monday uh, or Monday before last. It's now back below 15. So we very quickly, all that fear in the market that occurred on, on Monday, two weeks ago is now completely gone. So we've, we've completely reverted uh, all of that sentiment. And, um, you know, at the same time, we've also reduced a lot of the overexposure to equities in the portfolio. So this can provide a good bit of support near term 
for the markets as professional retail investors start grossing their books back up. And I, I'm sorry, what was the first question? Uh, is there really nothing to worry about on the carry trade anymore? No, no. Uh, look, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's uh, concerns on the carry trade. It, you know, overall, um, that's about a 15 to $20 trillion leverage that's sitting out there. So it's huge. Now, that doesn't mean you have to unwind every bit of 15 to $20 trillion to get rid of the carry trade. You just have to, sell, and as we saw last Monday, you just have to sell enough to basically meet your margin calls. And, you know, very quickly, the Bank of Japan stepped in and said, hey, we're not going to we're not going to hike rates anymore. There was certainly some currency interventions between the U.S. and Japan that occurred behind the scenes to stabilize that whole thing, because that that would lead, as I said, that could lead to a credit related event if that was allowed to continue unfettered. So, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that central banks were you know, intervening to help stabilize that currency spike. But yeah, if for some reason Bank of Japan comes out tomorrow and says, "Yep, we're gonna we're gonna hike interest rates to two percent tomorrow, and we're gonna do you know, you know we're gonna you know uh, try to create more inflation in our economy by doing X, Y, or Z," yeah, that carry trade becomes a problem real quick because it is very sensitive to where the Japanese yen goes. So again, you've got to you've got to figure out what will cause the Japanese yen to spike, and that, you know, and, and also can Japan actually hike interest rates? And that's the big challenge for Japan. They've been at basically zero interest rates for 30 years. Now they're trying to hike interest rates, which obviously when they hike interest rates, that attracts capital into the Japanese yen, which then changes that balance on the leverage. So, you know, they're trying to do that. But when you're carrying 230% of debt to GDP, you really can't hike rates much. Okay. All right. Well, look, I mean, Whatever happens with the carry trade, folks, we'll be tracking it week after yeah. week here for you. So if there's new stuff you need to know, don't worry, we'll be bringing it to you. Yeah. Um, but, but here, here's the bottom line of that: yeah. I would not be worrying about that right now. That's that's not you know that's not really a big concern at the moment for the markets. That's pretty much behind the markets right now. Okay, it, it has been duct taped back together. Correct. <laughs> okay, um, l let me ask you a question, sort of around this. Um, I know that your job which you you perform well is to be the eagle right um and what's interesting is is you know i i think you can look at the markets and it's not hard to come up with the um the impression that they are either doing fantastic <laughs> or it's armageddon right they're, they're like they, they seem to only have two modes you know awesome right. and awful Right. right. <laughs> and, and and we 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 just saw how quickly they go from one to the other and then back again. Right. right? And, and does that belie a vulnerability in the system here? Like when things can turn on a dime like that, um, does it suggest it, it to me that just doesn't seem like a very resilient market. You would think a resilient market would kind of flow from one to the other. Um, but when, you know, uh, it, j just like a person who the, you know, looks fine, but the, the, the slightest amount of adversity just sends them into a meltdown, usually a sign that their psyche is, is having some issues. D do you oh, worry at all about the market? Like, so basically you're calling the market Gen Zers. Got it. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not, but no, but, but I mean, is there anything to this point I'm raising? No, th look, th there's a couple of things that I think that investors are going to have to really just get used to uh, going forward over the next decade, which is going to be increased volatility. And the reason is, is that this is no longer really a market driven by humans that that, you know, step, you know, kind of look at data, make decisions and then transact business. Remember, the market's just driven by people buying and selling. That's that's all that's going on. Um, and, you know, trying to extrapolate all these other things about the market, you get away from the very basic fundamental fact, which is it's a market. For every buyer, there's a seller. And the only question is, at what price are they transacting business? Well, that used to be the case. And, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, the average hold time for stocks was six to seven years because we bought stocks. We looked at fundamentals. Um, you know, we got the Wall Street Journal three days after earnings reports were done. And, you know, we could see what the company did. So there was not all these knee jerk reactions going on in the market. So we didn't have, you know, these these volatile moves in the markets like we see today. Today, everything's driven by computers, which we have this real time data feed. And you got to remember, these algorithms are searching Twitter. They're searching YouTube. They're looking at, you know, every headline that comes out and, and you know, every every media outlet. These algorithms are searching everything and they're looking at 
you know, what stock names are being mentioned? How are they being mentioned? What is, how is that reflecting? What's investor sentiment related, you know, to that particular stock name? And these, these algorithms are trading off that information instantaneously. And so when, and again, again, the market's buyers and sellers. And as we've talked about recently, you know, I, I, you know, buyers live higher and sellers live lower. Uh, sorry, sellers live higher and buyers live lower. And the, and what happens is that when you have a market crack and everybody wants to get out at the same time, and that's mostly these algorithms going to sell. They don't care what they're selling. They're just sell. Some, in some level got broke. Something happened. And they said, sell, get me out. And they dump everything all at one time, which means that there's no buyers in the market. So prices have to keep falling until some technical level is hit where buyers will actually show up and start buying stuff again. And that's what you saw, you know, last Monday market gap down over 3% in the matter of moments, because that's where buyers were. They were 3% lower than where the markets closed on Friday. So what, in, what in individuals are going to have to get used to is understanding that that volatility is a new paradigm. We're going to live with that from now on because our markets are all driven by algorithms and programs, and everything else. So you're going to have to get used to these volatile swings in the markets and understand that when these volatile swings in the markets, those are going to be buying opportunities more often than those are going to be selling opportunities. Right, right. And you've told us many times, you know, 85% of the time stocks go up versus down, which makes it a bit easier to be a bull than a bear. Um, uh, I want to get back to that uh, in just a second. But one thing I want to underscore about what you said is... Um, you know, yes, if the algos suddenly flip from buyers to sellers, you get these massive downdrafts, but they don't even have to flip to being sellers. They just have to stop being buyers, sure. right? To your point, because then that, you know, that just opens up the question, okay, once all the algos are out of the picture, like, where is the next marginal buyer? Is he, was he right there with the, the algos or is he 3% lower, right? And that's why we can have these downdrafts, even if they don't even flip to full sell, they just, they, they can just stop, which they can do not even on a dime, on a milli-dime or whatever the time equivalent of that is, because these things move so quickly. Well, and, um, and two other things to that too. You know, we also have to remember that we've also had a massive change to the markets in terms of passive ETFs, which are now a, a, a very large share of buyers in the markets are these ETFs. And we've also trained a whole generation of investors over the last decade to buy the dip. Yep. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, we used to talk about FOMO, the fear of missing out. And that was where investors were coming in at markets at all time highs and they were buying stocks at the highest levels and keep pushing the price up because they were afraid of missing out on more gains in the markets. Now it's very interesting because as soon as the market sells off, you know, like last Monday, I didn't get emails asking me about, oh my gosh, Lance, is this the big one? Do I need to get out of my portfolio? That, that was, I didn't get one email about that. Every email I got, and I got probably over a hundred, on Monday alone, which was is now I the time here? to buy. Yeah. yeah, do I buy here? And most of these people, these these retail investors, are now have the fear of missing out on the bottom. Right, I don't want to miss the bottom, and they're standing there ready to buy ETFs, and they're buying the things they're buying are leveraged ETFs. They're buying the Apple two X long ETF. They're buying the Nvidia two X long ETF, which are just single stock ETFs. Uh, they're buying the index, they're buying leveraged index, they're buying the triple levered index. So every time they do that, that's just forcing more and more money back into these same stocks, back into these same, you know, indexes that that all that create these very sharp recoveries in the markets. Okay, so here's where I'm going with this. So I, I totally get and agree with the nature of the market has changed with algos and the hyper um uh, digital way in which markets run now and everything's done literally. I mean, when you, when you, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's now an old book, but I mean, if you read flash boys by Michael Lewis, where he talks about, you know, this whole high frequency trading world, there's just like eons of, of activity that happen in the blink of a human eye. I mean, it, it, it's so fast. We can't even comprehend, uh, how this, how this is going on. So I totally get that component, but, but part of why I asked the question is sort of like, um, what you were just saying there, which is um, hypothesis, I'm not saying it's necessarily true, but um, you know, market changes happen because of a shift in sentiment, right? People go from being net bullish to net bearish. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, it, it's, it's easier to be a bull because markets go up 85% of the time and everybody involved in the system wants to be a bull. They want, they want prices to go up, right? Everybody's rooting for the bull, the bull case. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. So, well, I mean, in, in, unless you thought you could make money being a bear, but I mean, right. but, but, but everybody wants it to go up. Every, all the participants do, all the people that are you know running the machinery do. So my point is, is, um, you know, you can argue, you can get to a point where valuations have exceeded what makes sense. And you've said this many times, you know, the markets right now are not priced on fundamentals. And so you, you get almost what I call sort of the Peter Pan effect, where in Peter Pan, you, you had to believe in fairies for Tinkerbell to stay alive, right? So everybody's believing in prices going up, you know, everyone's, believe but at some point, you know, doubt begins to creep in, even if it's subconscious or whatnot. And everybody is still on team bull, but they're increasingly like, uh, yeah, but if this thing starts petering out, I don't want to be the last one out the door. And so when you get little hiccups or little wiggles, you can get outsized responses to the downside because people are at the party, but they're kind of eyeing the door and anything that looks a little funky, they start to make a sprint for the door, right? And I'm just wondering, you know, are we in that kind of territory now? Could that explain some of this reason why? Yeah, it's a party until very suddenly it's not. Well, no, that's just, uh, you know, yeah, it's it's always a party in the markets. Um, and the markets are always going to, is always looking to go higher because earnings estimates are always looking to go up, right? So as long as you have earnings growth, um, markets are going to price in valuations based on forward earnings growth. So that's why there's a there is an extremely high correlation between the year-over-year -year rate of change in earnings estimates versus the year-over-year -year change in the S and P 500. Okay, so but, but that makes sense because you could almost say that's fundamentals, right? Stocks are supposed to be priced off their earnings right. terms. But yeah. but again, it's also about optimism, right? Right now, Wall Street is very optimistic that a will avoid a recession and b next year earnings growth is going to go up by fifteen to twenty percent. Yeah. So that that you know provides that that. Right. So that's the party environment. Everybody's at the party and the cops haven't shown up yet. So, you know, and this is why we talk about, you know, what is it that causes everybody to leave the party at once? If, you know, if the cops show up to the party and it's a friend of the party, right, then nobody's worried about it. So I mean, it's like, oh, that's Jimmy. He's he's a local cop. He, come on in. You know, he starts yeah. drinking with everybody else. You know, if the cops show up with the sirens on and it's the state troopers, it's a different story. So the, the difference is that in the markets, again, you do have a market that is overvalued, no doubt about that. It's very deviated from long term means. And, you know, so you've got to have an event, though, that is unexpected. Again, we go back to this unexpected exogenous event. It's got to be something that all of a sudden everybody goes, I've got to get out right now because I have no idea how to price that. I have no idea how to price that yen carry trade that just that, that spike in the yen. Hey, I'm getting my banker calling me and say I've got to cover my yen short, but I don't how I don't know how far that's going to go. So I've got to get out now and then I'll figure it out. And that rush for the exits is what causes markets to drop off so dramatically, so quickly. But that's why it's also very hard to hedge against because you those are the things you can't control. You know, but the things that people tend to worry about. Right. Those are the things that don't happen. Right. The end of right, the Because they're not on the if they're already on the market's radar. Yeah, no, exactly. Either either A, they're not the A the A, the market knows about it already, or B, there's such outlier events that the, the possibility of them occurring are extremely small. It's so low. Yeah. Right. So the markets bypass all of that entirely. And so people get very frustrated. It's like, I don't understand why this market's going up. If you looked at the debt lately, yeah, I understand the debt and the deficit. I got that. Markets know about it too. And markets have already factored that in, at least for now. So again, it's got to be some type of, of credit-related event, excuse me, that markets weren't aware of that causes these major unwindings and these major revaluations. And that's the that's the important key. So go back to 2008, look at what happened. It was a normal bear market up to September the 18th. When Lehman was forced into bankruptcy, all of a sudden, nobody could play the game anymore. And that caused that major repricing in the market. I had to reprice for fundamentals and earnings because I had no idea what those earnings were going to look like post the Lehman crisis. And so you had this very sharp contraction in the market post the Lehman failure. Prior to that, the market was just a normal, everyday, average, you know, kind of correction process. And there was really nothing to worry about. But that's what it's going to take to have this, 
you know, major decline in the markets and this major revaluation in the markets, it's got to be something that all of a sudden the markets go, I can't price this because I can't factor what earnings will be in six months from now because of this event, right? So that's that's the process you've got to figure out. And it's it, it won't just magically show up. We, you know, we will we will have evidence that this is coming ahead of time. The markets will start to sniff this stuff out ahead of time. Markets will start declining. It's like, hey, everything's fine, but markets are declining. We're taking out, and this is the way it was back in 2008. In June and July, we were taking money out of the markets because we were breaking important levels of support. We were creating a downtrend in the markets. We were failing at, at, at overhead resistance on rallies. And that was pre-Lehman. But there was enough evidence that there was something going on that it was worth de-risking portfolios over. And then when Lehman happened, then you know everybody goes, oh, yeah, there you go. But there was plenty of evidence that was going to occur before it actually occurred. Okay. And you could almost say that, I guess, in this most recent um, episode, right, where, I mean, stocks were declining from middle of July yep. before we had that that one big draw, uh, you know, one big drawdown day. But but leading up to that, the market was sort of signaling that all was not, yep. all was not hedge, perfect, right? Yeah. Hedge funds had been deleveraging their tech stocks for about two weeks prior to that event. So they were already, and, and look, the Japanese yen just didn't spike overnight. It wasn't like it was at dead record lows and all of a sudden went straight up on Monday. It was already starting to creep up. So that that impact was already starting to come. And as that yen was creeping up, hedge funds had already started reducing their tech stocks. And then it broke a technical level and you had a bunch of dumping occur. And then they had to finish that balance of, of, of unwinding their books at that point. But if you just paid attention to what the hedge funds were doing, and this is one of the reasons that we sold a bunch of our tech stocks back in on July the 13th was because we were already seeing that selling pressure come into the markets. We go, hey, look, there's something going on here. We need to re, re, you know, kind of reduce our risk in these positions. And so that measure helped us avoid a lot of that downturn on that Monday and have now set the portfolios up into being in a pretty good position. Okay. Um, one more point on this, and then, then we'll move on. Um, sure. So, you know, um, for the very few people that had bullish, sorry, bearish positionings, um, up until the, a week ago, you know, th they actually had a really good moment in time, right? right. Like if you were if if you were um, long the VIX, right? You did amazing, right? right. Um, for about a second, for about a second, and that's the point I'm trying to make here, which is, um, you know, we talk a lot about how um, it, it's it's much more challenging to take bearish positionings because the incident rate. Uh, where they they work in your favor is an awful lot lower, right? This is that eighty five percent, fifteen percent trade off you were talking about, right? And they also tend to be really short lived. So, like if you get the opportunity and you don't take it, you know, VIX is already back. What did the VIX get up to? Uh, almost third, uh, like twenty eight. It was it was interesting. So here, here's here's a great. I example. thought it got a lot higher than that, but I, it, I, I I have to go back and look where it actually closed that day. Um, but a good example of this, though, was is that on the Monday following, um, so on the Monday prior to the, the the yen carry trade blow up, we actually added a VIX head, a VIX option call option in our uh, high net worth platinum models, and we closed. So on Friday we had that we had a, a gap down. The market broke down on Friday, and we had a sharp breakdown. The market closed near its lows, and volatility started spiking. And we go, well, we're sitting on support and the market had this big breakdown on Friday. And so we had a nice gain in that VIX trade. And so we took it off. We, we took the profit in that. Now, if we would have held it one more day, we would have caught the, the yen decline on Monday. But as you, as you stated, the problem is, is that you have to be exactly right with those VIX trades because they move so quickly. And, and typically, you're better off just being short the VIX because these volatile spikes happen so quickly that the downturn comes back fast enough because immediately everybody starts piling back into equities. So, but yeah, unfortunately we closed our VIX hedge out one day early. So, <laughs> but, but, that's the, but that's the problem with trading to VIX is that if you don't get it right, all your gains go away in a day. Right. Um, well, look, I'm, I'm trying to pull up uh, the chart of the VIX here to see, I, I know it, clo it closed up at like, 37 or something like that at one yeah, point. That, but I think, that's, that probably sounds about right. And I think intraday, it, it got even higher. 
Um, and the, the point being there is just that, yeah, it was, if you didn't act right away, you kind of missed the opportunity, right? And and where I'm going with this is- um, Just real look. quick, here's a, here's a chart of it. So this was, here was Friday. This is where, we, so we bought, we basically bought our VIX hedge, you know, right over here somewhere. We closed it here and then that was Monday. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so where I'm going with this is, it, it, uh, you know, I understand that a lot of viewers, um, and I put myself in this camp, have a lot of concerns about, you know, current levels of overvaluation and whatnot. And as Lance, as you've said, that is that is very useful in a, in a long-term outlook, not useful in, in a short-term outlook, because obviously the market can remain overvalued for a lot longer than, than most people imagine. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're feeling more pessimistic about the market than optimistic, going back to your eagles, bulls and bears, you know, family, Lance, um, <laughs> you want to be the eagle and try to trade the market we have. But if you're not feeling comfortable enough hopping on the bull train, I'm going to introduce a new animal. Lance, what do you think about people who are bearish, you know, not being bears necessarily in terms of how they position their portfolios, but being turtles, right? Yeah. Which is just the slow and steady, you know, kind of let's play more defense than offense, but let's still be in the race, right? And this is the people who I would say kind of do the T-bill and chill, you know, approach and, you know, have some equity exposure, but not crazy long, mm -hmm. Um but it's just sort of like I want to build a portfolio that's just sort of a steady eddy portfolio here, not not taking on too much risk. But while they're giving me five percent in safety, I'll take that and maybe have a little bit of the portfolio to try to ride some of the equity upside. But if my fears happen and we get a big rollover, it's not going to be a mortal wound. Um, what do we think about the turtle for those folks? No, the, the turtle's fine. Look, we run portfolios for that. So like we have portfolios that are 20 percent stocks, 80 percent bonds. We've got 40, 60, 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20, the other way. So, you know, you can build your allocation however you want. What's So, you know, and th those are fine, right? And so the problem with the T-bill and chill thing is obviously the Fed's about to cut rates. So that, you know, the question you got to ask- will go away is, at some point, yeah. Yeah, it, it's going to go away pretty quickly. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to do now? Because I now no longer can get, you know, any yield on my money markets or my T-bills anymore. And I'm, and I'm, I'm stuck with equities. So, and again, this is going to be a real challenge for those uh, individuals that get themselves into that box. But, you know, again, there's nothing wrong. Look, our primary model that we run is 60% stocks, 40% bonds. It is over the last 130 years, it is hands down the best way to, to grow and manage money. It, it outperforms the S&P over time. It outperforms every other allocation over time. Because during big bear market downturns, if we if if and when we have one, bonds will play their defensive position exactly like they did during that yen carry trade blow up last Monday. Bonds were up four percent that day on during the process of that market decline. So it, they they did exactly their job. What you would expect is that in a bear market, unexpected exogenous sell off in the markets. Right, all of a sudden there's shock and panic. The first thing that institutions are going to do is go into T-bills or go into T-bonds or go into to long duration government bonds of some sort because they're safe. They're guaranteed that they're going to get paid back. They're highly liquid. I can put money into them. I can get money out of it. Absolutely no worries. I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily do that with corporates. I can't necessarily do that with other forms of, of bonds. So treasuries are always the first place that, that institutions are going to go. So building a portfolio that's 60% stocks, 40% T-bills or T-bonds, you know, however you want to build it, is absolutely the best way to manage your portfolio. You're going to get enough growth out of your equity side of your portfolio to hedge inflation over time, um, protect your purchasing. You know, and again, you know, you talk a lot about oh, the, the decline of the dollar, the purchasing power parity. Well, stocks are the very best way to ensure that you're keeping purchasing power parity of your dollars over the long term. Um, bonds are going to help hedge risk and provide income. And you put those two together, you've got a winning formula to make sure that your portfolio not only grows safely with lower volatility, but also generates an above above inflation rate of return over time and protects that purchasing power of your dollar into retirement. Okay, uh, very well said. And the reason why I bring this up is I, I know that one of your big, um, one of the things you try to help people avoid is the, you know, I'm uncomfortable by 
the current levels of valuation. Um, I think they're too overvalued. And so I'm just going to get out of the market entirely. Um, or they get real agitated and say, this has got to correct at some point soon. And I'm going to take some pretty big short bets, right? And then they get destroyed along the way if the market continues to rise. So, you know, I'm trying to maybe introduce the turtle as a way to say, for 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 people who are really feeling that pull, <laughs> um, to maybe not think about being the bear in terms of how they're constructing their portfolio, but to be the turtle for all the reasons that you just described, Lance. Right. Well, look, look, our, our job, you know, look, we, we get too sidetracked worrying about all of these big macro issues. And that's why, you know, I get a lot of emails. And I'm like, man, turn off the, you know, turn off the articles, turn off the media, focus on a what you do, right? So your job is what's your most important source of building wealth is your job and your savings. Most people I run into, they do a terrible job of saving money and they're hoping the market's going to bail them out. Right. And that's not going to work. So your your, your biggest source of, of asset growth over time is the money you save, not the money that the market will generate for you. Uh, what the market's job is, is to make sure your savings are growing for inflation and purchasing power parity. Right. So that's what you should invest for that, not chase some benchmark index, trying to beat some you know random index that has nothing to do with your personal life or your goals or anything else. But generate a build a portfolio that will grow your savings safely over time. And then worrying, but then you start worrying about these other big macro issues. Well, I heard this guy on the internet, he said that the debts and the deficits are going to cause a major market crash and we're going to be like Japan. Maybe, right? But that may happen well after your lifetime or, you know, the dollar is going to crash and we're all going to be living in, you know, you know, bartering on the streets with bottle caps, um, you know, Maybe, but if that happens, nothing else is going to matter anyway. So there's all these big macro concerns that you can worry yourself over. And in the process of worrying about all these things that have very small probability events of happening in reality, you're impairing that growth of your money and that purchasing power parity over time. And this is why when you take a look at 80% of investors, they have very, very poor performance over time. They have done, they have very little money saved up for retirement and worrying about all these big macro issues they have no control over in the long term has left them so far behind on their wealth growing process. They have permanently impaired their retirement, their ability to retire the way they, they could have or should have. Okay. Um, totally agree. Um, I, I guess the, just wrapping up on this and then we'll get to the recent data that came out this week. Um, so, uh, I completely agree with you, which is like, look, um, always better that we lean into our strengths and the things that we can control the most. Right. And for most people that is going to be their ability to generate an income and their ability to save as much of that income as they can. Right. right. Um, what's left over goes into investing. You then need to make a decision. Okay. Am I going to be the one in charge of my investing strategy and, and execution, or am I going to pull in? A professional to do that for me. And as I say in this channel every week, I think for the vast majority of people, the latter is a better choice because most people have lots of other things they've got to prioritize in their lives uh, to focus on family, job, all that type of stuff, right? Health. Um, <clears throat> so when I look at it, um, I, I do look at, it, hey, how can I make sure that my, my earnings and saving muscles are as strong as humanly possible? And then when it comes to investing, I look at it as um, first and foremost, an you know, a, a, a vehicle for keeping my purchasing power on pace with inflation, which we've talked about. That's kind of goal number one for investing, right? And then I think of it as that plus a call option, right? Which is, hey, there hopefully will be times where my money actually makes money for me uh, uh, on an incremental, a net incremental basis. Right where my my portfolio returns exceed inflation in some really uh, material way, but I'm not counting on it. That's the thing, right? Where I'm like, look, I'm 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 my goal is to feed the beast enough so that as long as the investing part keeps up with uh, inflation, I'm going to have the purchasing power I need by the time I need to meet my goals, right? Now, it may end up doing a lot better than that, which is fantastic. I'm leaving the door open to that, but I'm not counting on it. So um, I, 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 I would think you would think that's probably a good way to look at it, Lance. But what do you think? No, I mean, look, how you approach your own money management is up to you. 
Right. And, and again, you know, when, when I'm on with you, I get a lot of emails like, Oh, Lance, you're just always bullish. No, I'm actually not. I've been very bearish at times. And um, you know, I've been through the financial crisis. I've been through 1999, been through all these markets. Right. So I've been yeah. there. The, nobody knows the new house you're building is actually a, a former missile silo, uh, three feet, <laughs> three miles below the earth. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No. And I was explaining this on the radio show the other day. It's like, I'm inherently very bearish. I mean, my personal bias is, I lean more bearish, right? And it's it's a fight for me to, you know, because I look at all the same data, right? I look at all the, you know, the valuations. I look at everything else. I look at what I'm paying for, you know, shares of Apple or Microsoft or NVIDIA. And I'm like, this makes no sense. I mean, you can't grow stocks at, you know, 30 times earnings. It's, it's just crazy. But so there's, so just inherently I'm bearish, but from a portfolio management standpoint, I've got to set all that stuff aside and say, look, I've got to grow my money so that A, I make my clients happy, but B, I've got to grow my money to, you know, create the retirement fund that I want to create for my family. And so it's very, so that's a that's a challenge that we all face, right? And this is when we talk about, you know, psychological investing and psychological behaviors, because all these psychological behaviors that we have, whether it's loss aversion, which is the psychology of, I, you know, I just, I don't want to lose money. So I'm going to invest a certain, I'm just going to be all in T-bills because I don't want any, any principal loss uh, as an example, or I'm just going to get out of the market because I don't want to lose any money. Um, herd bias, where we just, we're just chasing the markets no matter what, and just whatever the herd says, that's the way I'm going. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, also, you know, looking at confirmation bias, that's another big one where we just only look at the data that supports our view. So if we've got a bullish view, we only read bullish stuff. If we've got a bearish view, we only read bearish stuff. And that's why if you go to our, our, our website, um, you know, you read the articles that we post three, four times a week, you'll see a bullish one and you'll see a bearish one and you'll see one that's economic destruction and you'll see another one that's bullish because we're analyzing. That's just our research. So we're, we're constantly analyzing all of these different outcomes of all this different data. In fact, the, today is talking about, you know, for, for people that, you know, are, are, you know, kind of wanting, you know, kind of that more of a, of a negative bias, I guess, for, for you know, outlooks. Uh, today's article on the website is economic growth myths and why socialism is rising. And we go through, you know, basically all of the impacts of just decades now of just, you know, running excess debt and excess deficits and why that's impairing the average net worth of American citizens and why there's so many demands now for socialistic policies. Um, we've got a whole campaign now of, you know, one of our presidential candidate, candidates talking about price controls, which is as socialistic and communistic as you can possibly get. And if you want a good example of how price controls work out, all you got to do is go 90 miles south of Florida and figure that out. Right. But that's where we are. But people are cheering that because they're like, oh, my gosh, my life sucks. I can't afford to buy, pay for groceries. Price controls are going to be great. Right. This is going to be awesome. Um, the consequences of that are terrible. But this is this is, you know, the things that we have to work our way through and say, OK, what is that going to mean? How is that going to work and how is that going to impact markets? Because markets are going to respond to this. If she gets elected president, markets are going to start repricing for those policies. If Trump gets elected, markets are going to start repricing for his policies, tax cuts, tariffs, those type of things. So, you know, this is where we've got to set all those biases aside and look at the data for what it is and start figuring out. How, is the, how are the markets and my investments going to respond to that and then manage that analysis along with the associated risk accordingly? So agree with it all. And I, I hope we get a little bit of time to, to dive through a little bit more of this uh, article here, although we're fast running out of time. So we'll see. Um, the, the, the last point to what I was trying to make is, you know, again, like the way that I look at, at, at the investing side for me is I'm I'm. I'm responsible for putting the wealth I need into the system. Mm -hmm. the The investing part is responsible for trying to protect the purchasing power of that wealth, right? That's right. And and if there's upside, like I said, I look at that like a call option. Like, okay, great, it's got some some optionality to the upside, but I'm not depending on it, right? Um, if if I have a phenomenal return in some of my investments and I can hit my goals a few years early, that's great, but I'm not counting on it because. And the reason why I'm underscoring this is I think one of the challenges that we've talked about is that a lot of people think of the investing part as, no, no, I put my money in there and then that makes all the money for me in the long run, right? You're, you're asking in many cases, 
dangerously a lot from the investing side. And so what you want to be able to do is give it the most, um, you know, uh, modest work it needs to do to hit your goals. The more, the more you're asking of it, the, 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 to, to, to do the real heavy lifting for you because you're putting less in at the front end or you're saving less, uh, the more risk you're putting on yourself. And, and what people tend to do is the older they get and they see that they're, they're farther away from their goals that they want to be, they start taking on degrees of risk to try to up the return that are unacceptable for where they are at their life stage. Correct. Absolutely. No, I get, I get tons of emails from people um, almost daily where I'm 71 I've got 150,000 in the bank and I need to grow it for my retirement. I'm like, what do you want me to do for you? Right. You know, uh, it's, it's, you're too late, right? There's, we don't have enough time and the rate of return you're going to need to meet that goal is going to be something that the markets can't generate. I had a really good question for, I had a good email question from one of your viewers just this week. Um, young gentleman, I think he was in his, his early thirties. I, I might be wrong on, on his age, but he's very young. And wants to invest. He's like, you know, I want, I want to invest in markets. I'm like, great. At your age, buy an S&P index fund, dollar cost average into it every month, every week, as much as you can. Don't worry about it. He's like, yeah, but can I make a higher return than that? And I'm like, sure you can. But you're going to risk losing a big chunk of your principal by taking on excess risk. All right. And so this is the thing that, that you know, to your point, this is the thing that people mistake is, is that I start expecting the portfolio to generate all, instead of me saving and budgeting and doing the sacrifice that I need to do to increase my wealth through savings, I'm depending on the market to do that for me. But that requires me to take on a lot of excess risk. Here's a good example of this. Let's say that my, my financial plan says I only need a 4% rate of return to reach my retirement goal. You go, Lance, that's, that's low, 4%. I can get that in a T-bill. Okay. So you want to take it to 5%? Sure, let's go to 5%. All right, that's fine. So that's a 20% increase in the rate of return, right? Because I'm going to add, I'm going to go from 4 to 5%. No problem. So I'm just going to increase my rate of return by 20% over that time frame. Problem is, is that's a 100% increase in the amount of risk I've got to take to generate 1% additional rate of return. Every point of return has an exponential increase in the amount of risk you've got to add to the portfolio to generate that additional rate of return. So you've got to factor into your outlook how much risk you're willing to take. And this is where one of the biggest mistakes in investing is made because people, they, they go, well, you know, the more risk you take, the more money you make, right? That's completely obvious. Risk is not a function of how much money you make. Risk is a function of how much money you lose when you're mm -hmm. wrong. So when you, when you look at risk, you factor it backwards. You say, well, if I'm going to take on this amount of risk, what does that potentially mean in a drawdown situation in my portfolio? So if you were heavily long equities going into last Monday, as an example, and we saw this with a lot of retail clients, they, not my retail clients, but general retail clients, they lost a lot more than the market during that crash on Monday because they were heavily invested into stocks like meme stocks and, and call options that they were buying. They were invested in small cap, mid cap, trying to chase that trade. And they got completely decimated through that process because they took on excess risk. Seemed fine on the way up. I'm making a bunch of money. It's all fun. It's all fun and games on the way up, taking risk. But when that risk shows itself, risk shows itself during loss periods. And that's why that's why we always talk about taking profits, managing risk, reducing balances, you know, those type of things. Because that's navigating that market. When you get a downturn, you don't have that big of a decline. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm sure folks are willing, ready for us to get off this, so we will. I just want to note, um, I, I did an interview a few days ago with John Pease from GMO, um, mm -hmm. from Jeremy Grantham's firm, and was so thrilled to finally get a representative of that firm to come on this channel. It was a big honor. Um, John's a young guy, but clearly very smart. And um, we were talking more about recession, but he, his point was a really good one. As he said, um, look, you, you, you get... You, you get paid a risk premium to invest in stocks. Um, you know, you, you, you get a higher uh, return investing in stocks on average than you do in other safer, uh, mm -hmm. safer instruments. And, and he said, yeah, that's, it, it, it's wonderful to receive, but you have to remember why you're receiving it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting that premium because you're taking additional risk. And so you've got to be willing to accept the other side of the coin, which is that 
when the economy is struggling and markets react to that, you're going to get the equity discount, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Where, you know, the, 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 you're going to get hit harder. And, and we have become, I think in particular with this whole passive investing, you know, theme, um, especially since the great financial crisis, you know, particularly up until the end of 2021, where the, the central authorities were really uh, intervening on a regular basis in the markets, um, people just got real complacent of like, oh, no, no, all, all I get is the good part of this, right? The bad part's gone, buy the dip, right? Um, and so anyways, people just have to be very mindful that if they are, if, if he's that that guy saying, yeah, but can I make more than, you know, what no, the S&P is going to make? Yeah, you can. You just have to really be, you know, cognizant that you are owning the other side of that, that two-edged blade too. Yeah. Well, look, and this is also an important point, which is that, you know, don't mistake what I'm saying is that you should be, you know, whatever allocation permanently, just, you know, you're 60, 40 stocks and bonds and you never change it. That's not the way to manage money either. You know, you, you just made a very good point, which was during an economic downturn, you know, you're going to suffer the consequences of those reduced earnings growth. And as as earnings, uh, earnings estimates decline and as earnings decline, the markets are going to decline in price as markets revaluate for those lower earnings. But you're going to see that coming well in advance. That is not something that's going to show up unexpected. And you're going to be taken by surprise. But all of a sudden, there was this economic downturn. You're going to see this coming months in advance. You'll see this, you'll, you'll see this process of earnings beginning to miss expectations. You'll see the, the negative revisions to earnings. So you'll have plenty of warning that this is coming. And when those warnings are, are starting to mature, then you begin reducing your exposure to equity allocation. So, you know, you go from 60% equity to 30% equity or 15% equity, and you shift a lot of your portfolio back into bonds, which will do better during an economic downturn. When economic, uh, when that economic you know, structure bottoms and you begin to see earnings estimates come back up, you begin to see improvement in earnings, you shift the portfolio back. So again, you have to navigate the markets, not just on the upside, but also the downside as well. And that's not difficult to do. If you can't do it, hire somebody that can. It's not difficult to do. You just have to pay attention, you know, to, to managing your money and managing your risk. Yeah. And and so anybody who's watching who, when you say that, you know, oh, we'll just, you know, ratchet down by X, Y, or Z. Anyone that's thinking, well, okay, how am I going to know how much to do when? Again, this is why I say recruit yourself a great financial professional to handle all that thinking for you and keep you involved so that you're understanding what they're doing and you're kind of learning along the way. Um, if you are a DIY person and want to do it yourself, that's great. Just keep A, educating yourself and B, you know, that's why I have Lance and uh, the guys from New Harper on this channel every single week so that you can crawl in the brain of these professionals and see how they think and see in real time what decisions they're making. And, you know, we'll, we'll give you their indications of what of what they're doing and you can factor that into your plan as well. Okay, so Lance, let's get into the um, the data that came out this week. Um, so it, it kind of a mixed bag. It's kind of interesting. So we had what many are taking as a, a positive CPI number and, and, you know, headline CPA now has a two handle. And I think that's important for the Fed optically, right? Yep. Where they can say, Hey, you know what? We are indeed, you know, getting close to our 2% target, 2.0% target. We're now in the twos, everybody. Right. So kind of yay Fed. <clears throat> um, I was interviewing, um, Mike Shedlock yesterday. That interview is going to come out uh, Tuesday following the release of this video. Um, he's looking at the base effect math, um, uh, as well as, um, shelter. And we'll talk about shelter in a second, but he actually thinks that we're going to see some pretty darn favorable headline CPI prints over the next couple of months, um, mm -hmm. to the point where he said he wouldn't be shocked if in say, you know, three months from now, there's like a 2.3% headline CPI. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're, you're nodding on that. Um, so, um, to a certain extent, um, you know, I guess that's good news, you know, inflation's continuing to disinflate. Um, one of the surprises I think, uh, in, in the CPI number was that shelter actually rose. I think shelter costs rose where people were still expecting them to continue disinflating here. I think Mike was thinking that 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 was maybe a sort of a one-off event, and he expects that to continue to disinflate over time. Anything notable to say about shelter beyond that? No, no, uh, he's right. Um, that you, you have we've seen these kind of anomalies before. It happened maybe 
seven, eight months ago. I, I have to go back and look at the chart, but we had this one month spike in homeowners equivalent rent. You got to remember that's a survey, right? So basically what happens is they, they call people up, they go, hey, Adam, what do you think you can rent your house for? Everything's booming right now. Everything's great. Maybe your neighbor just sold their house for a whole bunch of money, whatever. Uh, so you go, oh, I, I, yeah, I think I could rent it for, you know, $5,400. Um, and then the next month, reality kind of sets back in and that rate comes back down again. And so we've, we've seen these kind of anomalies occur. It's part of the data collection process. The trend of homeowners equivalent rent is declining and that will continue to decline. And if you take a look at what's happening with, uh, you know, home sales right now, particularly on existing homes, they're sitting on the markets a lot longer. Uh, the house I'm in is a good example. So I'm renting this house. I rented this house two years ago and locked in my rate for two years. So that rate hasn't changed for two years. Now, interestingly enough, I'm moving out this next Friday. And so the owner is trying to now rent the house at a much higher rate than what I paid for two years ago. So he's looking at the current rental rates around the markets right now and saying, okay, I think I can rent the house for this. It's not renting. They've been having showings for a month and a half and not one taker for the rent on this property. So either the rent's too high and he's overpriced for the market, which I would suspect he is just a little bit, but it's also a function that houses are sitting on the markets and, and rental houses in particular are sitting on the on the markets a lot longer now. And so that's going to cause, obviously, the longer they sit out there, and he, as he's already doing now, he's starting to cut that rent rate, trying to find the point at which he'll actually be able to find a tenant. He doesn't know where that number is yet because he hasn't got a tenant. But somewhere in there, he'll get down to a point that that'll happen. But we're seeing that happen across uh, the board. How's, you know, the, the supply of inventory of houses is now up to almost nine months. That's normally a recessionary level for a supply of housing. Uh, uh, new home builder sentiments dropping fairly sharply because again, there's lack of demand really for, for new houses as well as existing homes. Uh, that has a lot to do with rates. Everybody's kind of hoping rates are going to come down to spark that. But you've got a, you've got a, a big supply of multifamily properties that are sitting out there as well, which are also going to force a continued downtrend in multifamily and, and rental rates as well, which will all get reflected back in a homeowner's equivalent rent, which already, by the way, runs about a nine-month lag. So a lot of the decline in homeowners equivalent rent hasn't even showed up in the inflation data yet. So he, Shedlock's right that inflation is going to continue to decline um, over the next few months. And I won't be surprised to see inflation actually closer to 2% if some of the economic data shows up like I think it will later this year. Okay. Um, by the way, Mike also does think that the economic data is going to worsen going forward. So you guys might be on the same page there too. You know, there see, was a I'm, third I'm alternative. Totally bearish. I'm totally <laughs> bearish. See, right there. <laughs> Um, you know, there there is a third potential reason, too, why your house isn't renting, Lance, uh, just, just so we can be looking at all sides of the story here, which is that the creepy guy who currently lives there just might be scaring people off. Absolutely. We should not dismiss that at all. So, all right, Lance, so, you know, we, we have what looks like a relatively encouraging CPI report here, um, but two things to note about it. One, not not saying this is sign for concern, but but it is potentially due to just slowing demand, right? Slowing economic demand, which of course is what the Fed's been trying to engineer with its higher for longer campaign. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the things that was pulling prices down was um, auto sales. Uh, right. Apparently auto sales are really cooling off here at this point in time. So what's interesting is we then, just like a day later, we had the retail sales report come out which were a big beat. <laughs> and um, I've seen a lot of back and forth uh, online about this. I can't even say I fully understand it, but basically um, it seems like one of the things that was driving the retail sales numbers was, was higher than average contribution from the auto sector. <laughs> right. So you kind of have one report saying, well, autos are weak. And other reports saying, oh, auto strength yeah. is you know pushing retail sales. Um, the, the other yeah. thing, real, real quick, just before I let you go, because I'm going to let you react to this point too, yeah. is so the retail sales was the biggest monthly beat we'd seen in a couple of years, I think. Um, it was 1% month over month. Um, but it looks like the reason why the beat was so big month over month was because like we see with a lot of this data, the previous month was dramatically revised downward. Okay. And if you look at the data series for retail sales, it's like over seven, you know, seven times out of 10, 
uh, the revisions that happen, you know, in uh, to, to the past month's data are to the downside and, and much more so to the downside than the few upward revisions are to the upside. So, you know, everyone's cheering this big beat, but A, uh, maybe it's kind of fabricated because of it, it just looks good relative to the, the, the previously downgraded numbers. Um, and then if you can in your answer, like what's going on with autos here? Right. Well, no. So, so first of all, be real careful with with data like that because again, a lot of these are assumptions. Uh, the seasonal adjustments have a lot to do with how that number turns out. Uh, so again, this this big jump in auto sales, it's kind of outsized. So you know, if you take a look at auto sales, they're trending in a direction. All of a sudden, you have this big jump for some reason. Typically, those get revised away. It's it's a, it's a you know a, a data error from you know either a state reporting or whatever it was. Um, yeah, and we see this happen quite often. So be real, be real wary of, of numbers that are abnormal uh, within a given trend of data. Um, the other thing, too, is, is remember, we had, and this is probably going to affect auto sales, not only, you know, in the most recent month, but uh, in August, which was July, um, but also in August and potentially in September. Uh, you had Hurricane Barrel, uh, which, you know, came through Houston. Then you had Deborah go through uh, Florida, caused a lot of flooding. People have to replace cars. So, you know, cars that were hit by trees or were flooded out or for whatever reason, that's going to that's going to create a, a spike in auto sales because those cars have to all be replaced. Furthermore, Hurricane Barrel is a good example, shut down auto production. So there's there's now less supply in the market relative to the demand that's out there. So if we're looking at the price of used cars, if you have less you know, demand or less supply of cars and fewer cars out there and there's a demand for buying those cars prices. So these these you know data um, can be caused by exogenous events that eventually get factored away fairly quickly in the data. So you know I think you know the best way to look at retail sales is look at the trend of retail sales, which has really kind of been you know flat to declining slightly over really the last year or so. Right. That's that is what you would expect as consumers are basically just kind of treading water. And if you go back and look at retail sales historically, prior to the onsets of recessions or economic slowdowns, that's exactly what you see. Retail sales are going up as the economy is growing, and then they start to kind of peter out and flatline. And then you have a recession, and they turn down somewhat because you're in a recession. Uh, and then they start growing again as you come out of the recession. So, you know, what we're seeing is ex exactly what you would expect to see on a trend basis for retail sales as the economy is slowing down. And this is one of the big factors that people make mistakes with with their portfolios is looking at one month of data and then trying to make a decision on their portfolio based on one month of data. I got probably 15 emails this morning about, did you see that big jump in retail sales? That means that bond yields are going to go surging back through the roof. No, that's not what that means at all. You know, look at the trend of the data, look at the the, the longer term, you know, look at three month averages, look at six month averages, look at year over year trends. Those tell you a lot more about where uh, the economy is headed than one month of data. All right. Um, okay. So great points. Um, where I'm going with this is, look, the Fed's got a big decision coming up in September, right? Um, right now, everybody, everybody thinks the Fed's going to cut. And it's a debate on how much the Fed's going to cut. Um, the markets, preponderance of the markets thinks 25 basis points. But there are some out there, including Mike Shedlock, uh, who thinks that the Fed might be cutting 50 basis points. Um, I personally have a really hard time seeing how the Fed could justify cutting 50 basis points right out of the gate here. Um, I, I think that, you know, if it did, I think the Fed would say, hey, we're so confident that we're going to hit our 2.0% target soon that we want to start pumping the brakes now so that we don't overshoot on the way down, right? You know, that's a, a story that Powell's been saying for a long time. But, you know, at the same time, like, Prices are coming down. <laughs> um, retail sales, you know, at least the recent retail sales, strong unemployment while rising, still historically low. Markets back up near all time highs. Real Don't estate up near all time highs. Like th these are not conditions normally when a central bank starts tightening. I uh, start starts cutting. Right. I agree. Um, yeah. So uh, what what odds do you put at at a fifty percent uh, fifty basis point cut? I think pretty low. Um, you know, the Fed's been pretty clear that, you know, they're they're watching the data They're you know, and then they're seeing the, the slowdown in the data. 
They've opened the door for a rate cut at this point. Um, so I think they cut, uh, look, this is my personal opinion. I could be entirely wrong. So just, you know, take it for what it's worth. I think they cut 25. I think if they cut 50 out of the gate with, you know, the markets already kind of a little bit tenuous in terms of the economic data, et cetera, you might spook the markets and you might actually get a much a, a negative reaction to a 50 basis point rate cut from the standpoint of, oh, wait, you're you're apparently a lot more worried about this economic data than you kind of let on because jobless claims are still near record lows. Um, unemployment is at, you know, four, four point one percent. It's not, you know, huge. Um, so, you know, what are you seeing that suggest a 50 basis point rate cut is required versus a more steady approach of cutting at 25. So I think that's the risk they run if they go 50. And I think they're aware of that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start beginning to ramp up here. Um, so I'm going to cram a bunch of questions in here. Um, give me your short answers if you want. Sure. Um, China. Um, coming into this year, everybody was looking to, to China as that was going to be the big tailwind to the global economy this year, right? They, 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 China's finally gotten its act together. It's going to start growing again. Um, that really hasn't materialized. And uh, it's still having a lot of internal troubles. Um, uh, there have been articles coming out saying that they're in danger of hitting their 5% GDP growth target, which is crazy when you think, you know, not that many years past, China was always growing at what, eight, nine, we could always argue about whether the numbers are real or not. But 5% was almost unimaginably low for China just a few years ago. Um, home prices have dropped there at their fastest rate now in nine years recently. So their real estate market correction is still underway there. And that's where, you know, the vast majority of, of Chinese citizens have their wealth stored. So there's a massive negative negative wealth effect coming out of that. So um, I guess my question to you is, 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 could China actually now kind of become a drag on world economic growth versus the tailwind everybody was expecting it to be? I think it, I think it has been a drag on <clears throat> global economic growth. And if you take a look at GDP from where it was, you know, uh, this time in 2022, as an example, um, you know, our GDP has slowed a lot. Um, and that has a function of, of basically the fact we're running out of stimulus and, you know, household checks have run out. And so, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that impact. We're also seeing less, you know, foreign inputs into the U.S. economy from other purchasing countries. So our GDP is slowing down. So I think it's already a drag on the U.S. economy. Um, the question is, is will that continue? And I suspect that it will, um, particularly going forward. You know, they they did a lot of things back, you know, pre-2008. They were building cities that were identical to New York, as an example. And they were building massive city complexes that nobody lived in. And they were doing a lot to generate, you know, economic activity that didn't have a real economic purpose at the end of it. And now they're playing, they're, they're, they're paying the piper for a lot of that. And I, I think that's going to take a few more years to kind of work through. Now, again, will China eventually become a, a, a good investing opportunity? That, stock, that, that market has had a huge decline over the course of the last, really since 2021. If you take a look at the Chinese technology index is a good example. It's, it's it was 105 back in 2021. It's down to nine, uh, down to 30. Now, so it's, you know, it's had uh, roughly about an 80% correction, a 70% correction at this point. So at some point, that's going to be a great trading opportunity. I wouldn't touch it right now. But, you know, these things all ebb and flow over time. But, you know, I do think that they have been a tailwind. I think they'll continue to be a tailwind at least in the next year. You mean a headwind? Uh, sorry, a headwind. Sorry. Yes. Yep. Thank yep. you. Okay. Okay. Um... So just last point here about China, uh, this is an anecdote. So everybody take this with a massive grain of salt. But I was talking the other day with a real estate analyst and uh, they're, they're, they're trying to find actual hard data to corroborate this. And if they do, I said, please send it to me because I'd, I'd love to share it with my audience. But th they are hearing increasingly that foreign investors who bought US real estate you know, as a way to sort of just land bank, you know, the, the, their money outside of their their country. And, you know, out, out here in California, we've had massive, you know, inflows of hot money from Asia for a long time here, where people were totally price insensitive in, in buying 
the houses they were buying out here because they're like, look, if, even if it corrects by 50%, at least I got 50% of my money out of my home country and it's, it's non-confiscatable. Apparently, those investors are now beginning to sell and bring the proceeds of the sales back to their home countries because they need the money there. And if that is actually true, that is a massive new development here. Um, don't know if you've heard anything similar, Lance. First time I've heard this, like I said, it's anecdotal, so folks don't take this to the bank yet, but really caught my attention. Uh, maybe. Uh, I don't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, you know, again, the reason that, and this has been going on forever, I mean, Japan did it as well. They want to get their money out of China in particular into the U.S. because they would like that's you know this is the beauty of a communist country right everybody's like hey let's do communism in the u.s well <laughs> one of the reasons they want to get their money out is because the government says yeah that's my money uh right. not yours so you know i it's sure it's, it's certainly possible that maybe they're in financial situations in china and they need money to live on so they're selling their property yeah i think it's kind of like a margin call equivalent right it yeah could, it absolutely could be i have no evidence of that and i don't see it in the data right now but it doesn't mean it's not going on Okay. Well, if folks, if I get more corroborative information on that, I will I will certainly surface it here. Um, all right. Last point before we start to get to the real wrap up. And I do have some interesting announcements, folks. So definitely stick around for the wrap up. Um, uh, I was going to make this part of something else we talked about, but I'll, I'll just throw it up here for the time being so we don't miss it. Um, so we're starting to see delinquencies in, um, in increasing different types of loans really begin to materially pick up here. Um, maybe we'll just kind of keep this as something to talk about in more depth uh, in, in a future one of these videos. But this is sort of an indicator, sort of like the credit spreads plants, where I think it's sort of, an, you know, it, it gives us a sense of where things are headed. And certainly on the consumer side, consumers are increasingly struggling and rising delinquencies um, is a, a great way to measure that. Um, there's also a, um, a survey that just came out by the uh, company Affirm which reported no huge surprise, but three out of every five uh, Americans, uh, American adults surveyed said, hey, I don't care what the data says. I feel like we're in recession here. My, my lived experience feels like I'm living through a recession. Okay. So, um, you know, we're increasingly seeing, I think, uh, a lot of cross currents in the data. You know, some of the data looks good. Some of the data looks bad. But at the end of the day, if you just say, look, forget about how an academic defines recession, what do people think? Increasingly, there is now a majority of U.S. adults that say, hey, you know, I'm not doing well. That's right. I don't, I don't think that's anything that, that surprises anybody. Um, you know, again, you, you just look at the average American trying to make ends meet. You know, it's it's a, it's a challenge. And this is why everybody's so upset about the inflation. It's you know, why they're, again, this is today's article on the website. Why is everybody wanting free healthcare, free, free college, free, you know, uh, you know, everything, right? Uh, because they can't afford to make ends meet. So the government might as well pay for it for me. So, so you know, it, it, the main reason why I bring this up, right, is because consumer sentiment drives consumer spending. And the more and more consumers who say, I'm not doing well, I've got to, I've got to, you know, tighten my belt. Um, that's going to eventually impact consumer spending. We're a 70% consumer spending GDP country. Eventually, that'll really manifest in, in the economy. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, to your larger point, Lance, and, and I have been on record four or five years more uh, saying that I suspect that at some point, in one of the next presidential elections. Honestly, I didn't think it would be this quick. I didn't necessarily think it'd be this one, but I, I, I thought the odds of kind of a democratic socialist coming into power, riding a really progressive platform um, was increasingly likely because when people, and this is why I talk about the dangers of people giving up on, on the social contract in America, when you no longer believe the American dream is reachable, when you no longer believe that the social contract uh, exists anymore that if you work hard you can advance your station then you start giving up and you know the appeal of the candidate that says if you start you know taking a fatalistic view and saying hey it doesn't really matter who gets elected i'm going to get screwed either way I'll, i may as well at least vote for the guy that's promising me free stuff right, right. that becomes a very understandable political choice I'm not saying it's a good one i'm not saying it's going to end in, in any place that we we want to be at 
but I can certainly understand why the pendulum swings that way. And I, I'm actually very surprised right now that that some of the policies that you just mentioned that are getting floated right now that are seem to be pretty heavy uh, towards the socialist side of things aren't getting more pushback uh, in the mainstream media right now. And the fact that they're not makes me a little bit worried that, oh, my gosh, this timeline could happen sooner than I thought. Uh, you know, these the, these are things that, you know, we look at every day in relation to the economic data, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, retail sales or or the economy in general and where things are headed. And this is one of the, you know, what you're bringing up is exactly why, you know, over the last year and a half to two years, I've been, you know, while everybody else was saying inflation was going to go to the moon, I was like, nope, inflation is going to go back down to 2% or less because it's all reflective of economic growth and everything we did to consumers across the board was going to generate lower rates of economic growth. And we're still seeing that, that that's not going to change. That's deficits, all those type of things. Those are all very negative for economic prosperity. Now, the one thing you've got to remember about consumer sentiment also, and it's important is who you poll. So, you know, if, if you take a look at the breakdown of consumer sentiment, you know, those making over $100,000 are a lot more optimistic than those making less than $50,000. Right. Well, that's, so, that's your, your two out of the five are still doing fine. Exactly. So one's doing know, great. The other one's, you know, exactly. status quo. <laughs> but you do great. One in the middle does all right. And the two at the bottom are struggling. So, yeah. Yeah. Although I would say it's three struggling, you know, one yeah. doing okay. And then one doing fantastic. Sure. All right. Um, all right. Well, so Lance um, trades. Um, sounds like you maybe haven't made that many trades in the past week, uh, but I think you mentioned no, no, it earlier. Uh, but is that is that in fact true? Or no, no, we we did a, we did a little bit of uh, kind of again just again as we kind of you know as the markets are doing their thing, you know we're just kind of watching uh, you know our portfolio in general and and what it's doing and and you know doing surgical precision uh, kind of trades where we need to. So for instance, in the dividend equity model, uh, we sold. Philip Morris this past week. Um, the only reason we sold that was because the stocks had about a 30% gain since we bought it on January the 19th. And this is a company that basically isn't growing revenue to any great degree. It pays a very nice yield, but we spent a lot of time on Thursday's uh, uh, real investment show um, talking about dividend investing and how to approach it, the things to look at, um, you know, importantly, things like uh, price to earnings growth as an important metric. So, that was a, a key reason we sold that particular stock. Now, we will probably buy it back at some point when it corrects, but we're looking for a substitute now for the dividend equity model. In the, equi in the equity model, um, we sold today, actually on Friday morning, we trimmed off uh, both ExxonMobil and Diamondback Drilling back towards their target weights because A, we were overweight energy, um, going into the summer. We're now through most of summer. So now most of the driving season, hurricane season is, is kind of getting behind us. Uh, we've had a nice little rally in oil prices over the last few weeks. And so that's been great. And now there's talk about potentially, you know, that, you know, kind of a, a deal may be made between, um, you know, Israel and Hamas. We'll see if that works out or not. But if they get something where it kind of calms down the tensions, that's going to start to suppress oil prices some. And there's downside in oil prices to about $60 a barrel heading in towards the end of the year, particularly as inflation continues to cool. So we just took profits, um, you know, most stocks just reduced them back to target weight. In our ETF model, we reduced our uh, energy ETF position uh, back down to target as well. But that's that's about all we've done this week. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, in uh, beginning to wrap things up here, um, uh, we don't really have time for one of our traditional rants, Lance, um, but I will say that uh, one of my highlights for this week was, uh, this was last night, um, I've been uh, doing a little bit of backyard gardening. Um, I used to do a lot more um, the place I used to live before where I live now. Um, but anyways, I, I, one thing I've never been super successful at growing that I actually seemed to have gotten better at this year was corn. Um, and so uh, I, I've had these corn stalks that have been going gangbusters and I've been waiting to finally have the first ear of corn off of them. Uh, last night, got my first one. Um, it was just heavenly. I mean, the thing went from the garden, you know, I broke it off the stock to in my belly within less than 10 minutes. Uh, just nothing is better than fresh grown produce and, and, and on a nice summer evening. Uh, a nice hot, you know, ear of, of fresh corn, uh, just perfect. 
So um, look, you know, Lance, you and I talk a lot about um, fitness and longevity and quality of life and whatnot. And nutrition plays um, a ridiculously important um, factor in that. In fact, I, I consider it sort of unfairly uh, it, it, it punches above its weight unfairly. If, if you want to talk about, you know, its impact on how you feel, um, your general health, uh, in general, and then also how you look. Um, and so I highly recommend that everybody, you know, a eat locally, a eat organically if you can. Um, but also just from a, just from a life skill standpoint, um, you know, learn how to grow stuff. And what's, what's, what's great about a backyard garden is, Look, you know, the odds of us going back to some sort of barter town, Lord of the Flies, you know, scenario where we're all having to like um, uh, grow our own food, food to support ourselves, I think is is quite low. Um, it, you know, if we were really were to get to that point. But if, if you try to grow something, what you learn real quickly is it's really easy to kill things. <laughs> it's actually hard <laughs> to get them to grow. And if you were going to depend on yourself for your calories, you're going to realize real quickly that that's almost a, an insurmountable task. Um, it, 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 it takes a lot of work to raise, you know, a single tomato plant or other stuff, right? I mean, when you really look at the calories you need versus what you're going to generate yourself, you're going to have a hard time doing it. But if you ever had to, right, if you have the skills of learning how to grow something in your backyard uh, from seed or, or, or uh little transplant uh, to full producing um, uh, product. Uh, again, that's a learning curve, but once you're up it, you can scale that up or down a a as you need to. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, I, I, I just find, you know, practicing this comes with all sorts of physical and mental benefits. It also gives you the resiliency benefit that if you ever actually had to create some sort of, you know, material percentage of your, your own calories, you're, deliver, you're, you're developing the skill set to do that. But really, at the end of the day, Lance, you do it just because it just tastes amazing. So I already know how when you send me the link for this article or this video, I'm going to tweet it out as Adam does corn. <laughs> Should that be the title instead of the one you gave me earlier? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That'll get tons of clicks and views. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm just curious. I mean, I live in ground zero for the sustainable food movement, you know, up, up here in Northern California, there's tons of small farms around us that, that do things extremely sustainably. Some of them world famous. What's it like there in Houston? Um, we grow things the old fashioned way, lots of cow dung and, you know, stuff like that. But yeah. So, yeah. Not, not too many farmers markets. No, no, no. Yeah. We, we, there's a few, um, but you know, most of it is, is kind of just, things that have been doing it the way in Texas, we've been doing it the same way for the last 150 years, right? So, um, you know, we have really big ranches, big farms all over the state. There's And there's certainly, you know, places here that are doing, you know, kind of more uh, renewable, you know, type uh, type farming and uh, more sustainable type farming. That's certainly, you know, tried to catch on. It was interesting. Uh, there was a big, a big sustainable farming operation just went bankrupt this past week. So again, there's that's still that's still technology that's got to be proven out to see if that's actually going to be viable long term. But you know, it, it's it's interesting is, is that you know when you talk to people and they're like, oh, you know, I have you know I'm worried about kind of the you know economic destruction of America and I'm worried about all this other stuff, so I have all my money in gold or whatever. And this is one thing I've talked about before with you, which is you know it's important to you know have good firearm skills, have good abilities to you know be able to hunt and live off the land because in the event of an economic crisis where everything falls apart, 90% of Americans won't survive more than a month because they don't know how to farm. They don't know how to hunt off the land. They don't know how to find fresh drinking water. They don't know how to do the very basics of survival. Most people will not survive in the event of an economic crisis or fallout. So, you know, one of the things, and so I do, I have, I have a whole library of books on, you know, how to survive off the land and, you know, build traps and all these different types of things. And, you know, these are skills that we practice every year when we go hunting or, or fishing or whatever else we do. All right. Well, good, good that you're actually working on keeping them maintained. And look, folks, I'm not trying to sell at all a post-apocalyptic version of the future here. I'm, I'm more saying do it for your health and because it tastes wonderful. Um, but no, so, these skills are very important. So much of what we talk about, Lance, right, is, is uh, uh, many of the solutions we're going to need to carry us into a better future in many ways are going to be a return 
to the values and the practices of the past, right? Um, yep. And food production is a, a key one of them. Um, I'm super excited too. My um, uh, I, I, my daughter is on the East Coast right now. She's pretty interested in, in sustainable food production. And uh, I'm friends with Joel Salatin, um, who is probably the best known sustainable farmer in America, probably in the world. Um, and his his uh, farm is out not too far from where she's staying. So she's actually going to go and get a private farm tour from from Joel and uh, get to spend some time with him and his staff, which is going to be wonderful. But in reaching out to Joel to ask if he'd kindly do that, um, I also uh, asked him if he wouldn't mind coming on this channel here uh, for an interview. So folks, um, if you know who Joel is, I'm sure that this is exciting news for you. Uh, but we'll be interviewing him at some point in mid-September. So at some point middle of next month, uh, expect to see Joel here on the program. He is one of the most fun and most fascinating interviews I've ever done. And also, uh, you know, there's the expression, don't meet your heroes because they never live up to your romanticized version of them. Joel is one of the few guys that really breaks that mold. He's an even better, higher caliber person uh, and more fun to be with in person than he comes across uh, in these interviews. Um, all right, well, look, and wrapping up here, um, if, uh, if the thing that nourishes you the most is your weekly dose of Lance on this channel, please let us know by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below. as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, if you uh, would like uh, help with uh, your plans to figure out um, how to get the investing side uh, of your life uh, into the best uh, condition it can be, think of it as almost like a personal trainer for your investing muscle, uh, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses, uh, perhaps even Lance and his team there at RAA. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. Um, lastly, and this is the big announcement that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so I've been I've been telling folks that we're going to be doing the fall conference this year. We locked in the date for it. It's October 19th. That's a Saturday. Um, that is the uh, 37th anniversary of uh, Black Monday uh, from back in the 1987 crash. Uh, someone just pointed that out to me. So we'll, we'll, we'll take whatever significance from that you will. Um, but I, I do just want to say uh, we have now locked in about 85% of the faculty, and, and this is going to be amazing. I, I, this is no offense to previous conferences we've done. This is hands down the best faculty we've had so far in terms of its uh, its quality and the standard level it's setting. Um, uh, I haven't officially um, announced this yet, um, so take this, I guess, as the official announcement. I'll be sending an email out to our newsletter list on Monday, folks. So all the other details will be coming soon. But just real quickly, let me let you know who's involved uh, in this conference. So we've got Lacey Hunt, who will be doing the kickoff keynote. Those of you who have watched in the past uh, know that that is worth the price of admission in and of itself. Uh, we're then gonna have Stephanie Pomboy there. We're gonna have Darius Dale. Um, and, you know, Darius was just on this channel giving us uh, the latest on his model. He'll be giving us uh, the absolute latest uh, you know, this is two months from now. So as we're heading into the new year, heading into the election, he'll be giving us the, the real-time readout of his models there. Uh, we're going to have Tom Honig, a former Federal Reserve official and sitting member of the FOMC. He also used to head the FDIC. Um, he's going to be interviewed by Danielle DiMartino Booth. So we're going to have her in the mix as well. Uh, we'll have uh, Michael Pento here giving his market outlook. We'll have your partner in crime, Mike Leibowitz, on to talk about bonds. We'll have Stephen Bavaria back to talk about um, uh, investing for income. He's the income factory gentleman. Um, we'll have Brent Johnson giving us the future projections of the U.S. dollar. Um, we'll then have Lynn Alden on talking about ways to hedge against the loss of purchasing power of the dollar and other fiat currencies. She'll be talking about Bitcoin. She'll be talking about precious metals. Um, we'll then have Melody Wright talking about housing. Uh, we'll have Rick Rule talking about resource stocks. Those of you that have uh, participated in the past know that uh, Rick comes with like 40, 50 tickers uh, that he thinks are worth, uh, you know, viewers go investigate. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to have all of our advisors like Lance and the gentleman from New Harbor and Jonathan Wellam from Rocklink in Canada. We also still have room in there for one other, one or two other VIP guests. So there's still hopefully will be some positive surprises coming forward. But that is a rogues gallery, uh, just a murderer's row of talent there, folks. It's going to be amazing. So if you want to uh, secure your tickets early, go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash conference. You'll get the early bird price. And if you are a subscriber to um, uh, our newsletter, our Substack, um, a premium subscriber, 
you will get uh, $50 off the conference. And if you do the math, only costs $15 a month to subscribe, uh, to become a premium subscriber, uh, you save $50. So if you want to game the system and just subscribe just to be able to sign up for the conference and pocket $35, I am happy that you get that benefit. All right, Lance, um, in wrapping up here, um, real quick, I just want to let folks know we've got some great folks coming up on the program next week. Uh, videos following this one are going to be Grant uh, Williams, Stephanie Pomboy, Mike Shedlock, as we mentioned earlier. And folks, if you didn't see it already, go watch that video with John Pease from GMO. Um, really important uh, perspective that that firm brings. It's one of the most widely respective in, respected investment firms in the world. And hopefully we're going to have those guys come on the channel a little bit more going forward as well. Um, so Lance, as we wrap up here, what, what are your parting words to the audience? Um, we'll see what happens next week with the markets and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.